start. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening. I'm Susan Drummond, City of Pasco Hearing Examiner. Uh, tonight, it's uh, Wednesday evening, April 14th, 2021, 6 p.m. Uh, we have two items on the agenda. They're both special permits. Uh, one is for the Mattias Sober Home Community Service Facility, uh, special permit number 2021-004. Uh, the second proposal is for uh, Elsa Hilly Fortify Holdings. This is a... Um, housing conversion from a hotel to um, apartments. Um, and that's a special permit number 2021-005. The order of procedure on both of these matters will be as follows. We'll hear first from the planning department. The department will provide a summary of the proposal. Then the applicant will have an opportunity to present. And then we'll open this up for public comment. Anyone who has called in or is online and wishes to comment on the proposal uh, may do so. And then the applicant will have an opportunity to address any questions which arise. And I may have questions throughout. Um, and then uh, the, the record on most of these is kept open for um, a little bit, day or two, uh, just due to the remote nature of the hearing in case there was anyone who had difficulty calling in. And then a decision for me is out within 10 business days. Uh, are there any questions on procedure before we proceed with the first matter? No. Okay. All right. Um, and Mr. White, are you presenting on uh, the, the community service facility proposal matter A? Actually, uh, Madam Examiner, Mr. Adams is presenting on both items on tonight's agenda. Oh, okay. All right. It's hard for, for me to see everyone in the hearing room from uh, this, this perspective. Um, good evening, Mr. Adams. I think I should probably swear you in. If you could state your name for the record. Jeff Adams, City of Can you swear or for Sorry. Go ahead. You swear or affirm to tell the truth under penalty of perjury under the laws of the state of Washington? I do. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Adams, I did review the staff report on this proposal and the attachments to that. So I'm familiar with what is being proposed. All righty. So for the benefit of our listening audience, um, this item is for a community service facility level two special permit in an R1, which is a low density residential zoning district. The proposal is located at 711 West Octave Street, which is adjacent to the county courthouse facility to the east and approximately two and a half blocks east of Captain Gray STEM Elementary School and Pasco High School and approximately a block south of a daycare facility the property is zoned R1, which is low density residential, and it is approximately 0.13 acres in size. Um, as mentioned, applicants wish to locate a sober home community service facility level two of the property. Special permit review is required for all level two community service facilities. Um, the proposed uh, residents or the residence features four bathrooms, a kitchen, a dining area, a common living area, and a utility room. The proposed total occupancy would be eight to 12 men, depending on the source of information. We have a SEPA, a State Environmental Protection Act checklist, SEPA checklist, that uh, at one time called for 10 to 12 um, people. And then the Department of Corrections application specifies eight men and so there's a little bit of incongruity there according to pasco municipal code 25.15.080 family means one or more persons but not more than six unrelated persons living together as a single housekeeping unit for purposes of this definition and notwithstanding any other provision of this code Persons with handicaps within the meaning of 42 U.S.C. subsection 3602H will not be counted as unrelated persons. The proposed location is intended for men who may have alcohol, alcohol and drug disabilities and mental health issues. 
which are considered disabilities under this provision. However, the earned re release date ERD housing voucher program, um, which applicant is applying for, does not limit its clients to persons who have alcohol and drug disabilities and mental health issues. As such, the facility would not qualify as a group care facility solely under the earn release date housing voucher program. Um, just for the information of the viewing audience, applicant has been cited several times over the last 17 years by City of Pasco Code Enforcement for civil violations for that property. Um, also for illegal construction activities, including an illegal single family dwelling unit to duplex conversion um, as well. The applicant lives in Benton City and the DOC staff um, works out of Yakima. And so that's kind of a summary of the, the staff report. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Adams. I have a couple of questions just on some uh, just uh, some documents that, that I that I don't have, but um, I think at this point we'll turn to the applicant. Is the applicant online? Madam okay, Examiner, I do not see any applicant for this uh, app for this proposal. Okay, all right. Um, is there anyone from the public who wishes to comment on the proposal? I, I didn't, I'm not seeing anyone on uh, my screen, but uh, Mr. White, um, do you see anyone who wishes to, uh, is signed up to comment? I do not. Okay. Um, we'll let the ref record reflect that uh, the applicant is not present and that there is no one who has appeared who wishes to comment today. Um, I was surprised there, are they, as the findings note in the staff report, there's not a mitigation plan um, that the applicant has proposed, uh, particularly given that there are a couple schools and from uh, that are proximate to the facilities. And Mr. Adam, uh, you mentioned there's also a daycare that is also uh, nearby. Um, I think the one there, there are a couple documents I should get, uh, Mr. Adams, if you could forward the DNS SEPA checklist and application to me. Um, I think I probably should have those documents. Um, and I think I, I'll keep the record open uh, just due to the remote nature of the hearing through uh, close of business tomorrow, 5 p.m. Um, so that if there is anyone one who did intend to comment tonight um, and was unable to sign in for whatever reason, they can provide um, comment um, to the planning department and then the, any comments would be forwarded on to me. Um, Mr. Adams, any other questions on that? Did you say till tomorrow else? or Friday? I'm sorry? Did you say you will be um, keeping the record open till tomorrow or till Friday? Uh, just tomorrow. I think that's um, that's sufficient um, given that there were not um, any comments. But yeah, just through tomorrow. And um, the only, the only the additional documents, if you could send those over to me. Is that sufficient time, Mr. Adams, for you to get those to the DNS, the checklist and the application? The DNS and the application, yes. Yeah, and the, you might as well have the SEPA checklist as well. Okay. So those three documents, I think, should be sufficient. Um, okay, I think that's it. Mr. Adams, anything else on that one? Nothing from, from us. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, we will move then to the next um, agenda items. This is the occupancy housing conversion, which as I understand it would convert um, what were formerly hotel units into residential units. Um, again, special permit number 2021-005. Um, Mr. Adams, I've also I reviewed this, the, the revised staff report that was submitted on this. It looks like there was a DNS that was just issued, which removed the cultural resource condition. I think that was ju that was just issued, so I'll need to keep the record open on that because there would um, mm -hmm. presumably be a 14-day comment or appeal period on that. So, um, but anyway, I'll let you address that. Um, and then there, I, I, I reviewed, of course, the staff report, and then there was. Um, the applicants council submitted an email on this. I think on yeah on Monday. And then there was a response from the city's council that was 
um, submitted on the uh, yesterday, the 13th. So um, with that, Mr. Adams, if you want to proceed and you remain under oath. Thank you. Um, so this is for special permit 2021-005. Um, the proposal is to convert a motel into a long-term single room occupancy um, or long-term single room occupancy units in a C3 zoning district. Um, C3 is for general business. The parcel is located at 1520 North Oregon Avenue at the southern terminus of Highway 395, um, just south of the state Highway 12 I-182 freeway interchange. The property is currently zoned C3, which is general business. Um, it is approximately an acre and, well, 1.85 acres in size. Um, applicant Fortify Holdings LLC has submitted a special permit application for the conversion of 104 units of motel, um, 104 utel, motel units um, into long-term single room occupancy units. Um, special permit review is required for all single room occupancy unit conversions. The site is occupied by three two-story structures comprising 28,500 square feet of motel space and it was built in 1979. The Pasco Munis Municipal Code section 25.162.040 specifies um, a list of development standards for all SROs um, including no more than two adults over the age of 18 can occupy any of the units. One off-street parking space is required per two units. 24-hour on-site management is required. Um, bathroom and kitchen, kitchenette facilities must be provided. Um, there are some options there either within the dwelling unit or in a central location for common use with one full bathroom per every three units and one full kitchen per floor. Um, they, there would be one handicapped accessible unit per 20 units. And so in this case, there would be at least six ADA units required. Um, one washer and dryer must be provided for every 20 units. Uh, mailboxes, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And as noted, applicant has requested a waiver of school impact fees. However, as school impact fees are tied to building activity, this pertains to the building permits and not to special permits. As such, the disposition of the school impact fees will not be considered during this hearing. And that is that Yeah, is I, um, I'll ask the applicant's counsel um, about that. I see he's, he's um, appeared, but I, um, I guess I, I don't see how I would have jurisdiction over the impact fee um i mean and the applicant could have applied for a building permit and consolidated everything and then if disagreed with the city then i guess an appeal could have been filed with me but i think the way this proceeding has been structured i right now anyway i'm not seeing uh, jurisdiction over the impact fee issue but I'll, I'll let the applicant's counsel address that question uh mr adams anything further that's it for us Okay, and um, would I guess I, I do have a question both from the applicant and from you in terms of procedure, given the DNS just came out, um, probably the approach on that in case there were, I mean, probably unlikely there would be an appeal on that, but um, I assume that's a 14 day clock on that. So we'd need to keep the record open for at least 14 days. And if you did have an appeal, then you'd reopen and probably hear it at the next regularly scheduled hearing. Uh, but do you have any comments on that? I do not. Okay. All right. Um, so let's turn to the applicant. Um, Mr. Ficus, did you, were you going to present first for the applicant or how did you wish to proceed? Uh, the, there are several people signed in, uh, Madam Examiner, on behalf of the applicant and including the applicants okay. themselves. Could you, could you unmute uh, Mr. Ficus or all of them if they are, to the extent they are muted? I'm not sure. Okay. Good evening, yeah. Madam Examiner. This is Mark Ficus. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Good All good right. evening. 
Are you offering legal um, argument or evidence? If 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 the latter, then I should swear you in. Um, I'm off. I'm off. In primarily legal argument. I have with me today, if the technology is working, Mr. Robert Johnson, who will present evidence on the project and the, and the requirements of the SRO permit. And I also have the president and owner of the company, Mr. Zian El Sahili, online, who may provide testimony. So my my presentation will be designed generally on the two conditions: the legal issues implicated by the architectural wall condition and the uh, unique impact fee issues raised. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. And on the impact fee, I, uh, I guess the way it's structured, um, I guess I, the, I don't make that initial determination. I mean, an, an impact fee appeal can come before me, but there's, there's been no city determination as yet. Um, and of course it's, this is not a SEPA issue. This is because uh, it's run through the, the city's impact fee ordinance. Um, so I do have a, question on uh, my ability to address that particular issue. Of course, the fence, that's uh, that's certainly before me and uh, or not the fence, the, the wall, the um, I have a, question, a couple questions on that, but I'll let, let you all proceed before I get um, ask about that. Well, all right. Good, good evening. I'll, I'll, I'll address those head on. And again, uh, appreciate the opportunity to present uh, some unique legal arguments. I think this is the first SRO permit the city's heard under its relatively new ordinance, which is perfectly designed for this client's project. My client is a Portland uh, multifamily developer that specializes in converting underperforming hotel units into um, higher quality single room occupancy facilities. The facilities are designed to hire uh, usually medical students or young professionals that frankly, I'll give a hint on the merits. It's highly unlikely that these units will house school-aged children, uh, thus the impact fee exemption and waiver request. I'll get to that uh, in a minute. But uh, let, let's start with the, I'll just hit my two issues, then I'll let my client make a presentation, Madam Examiner. But, and the first one is, I don't see any requirement uh, when you're doing simple interior renovations on an SR, O, or SRO permit to require a block, uh, expensive block wall along the entire frontage of Oregon Avenue. This is an entirely commercial area. It's not the nicest neighborhood. There's no residential zone properties to site screen. Fencing only has two purposes from a land use standpoint, site screening or safety. Neither are implicated by interior renovations to a hotel unit. It's gonna look the same. You know, there might be some cosmetic renovations but my client would ask that the, uh, the, the, this was the first, it didn't show up in the pre-application meeting and, and my client is extremely concerned about the reason and the cost of a expensive architectural block wall fence, which will only serve to attract graffiti and won't do anything for the project. So that was, that's, uh, I, again, I don't see any legal basis in the staff report. Um, I've reviewed the development regulations, uh, it looks like the commercial development regulations on landscaping and site screening and PMC 25180 don't apply to renovations to existing commercial buildings. Uh, again, and I'll, I would. I, are I would, there any um, landscaping improvements that are being proposed with um, the, this project? No, no, there are not, not to my knowledge. Although I'll, I'll let Mr. Johnson, uh, he had a unique conversation with the owner, remember, uh, Fortify is the applicant. We we have not purchased the property yet. We're in our due diligence period. But the owner says that the city did require some landscaping uh, along the boundary. And I don't know whether it's relatively recently uh, or not. Um, I don't know what basis that would be. That's all I have. And I'll let Mr. Johnson address that when he makes his presentation. Okay. Um, but but again, we would we would ask that there there does appear the. The permit has not caused the need for an expensive architectural block wall fence, and our client would like that condition removed. Um, and again, I assume you may have a question or two for for Jeff or, or for Rick. So I'll move on. the The more interesting one that's that's really unique. I've never seen this before. And again, I've been doing land use for thirty five years. I, it is, this is a. It, 
the city raised at the initial pre-application meeting that this project might be subject to impact fees. And as you know, Madam Examiner, PASCO has impact, both school impact fees and park impact fees. And their school impact fees are pretty steep. They're basically, you know, oversimplified $4,700 per unit. If I were doing, you've seen me before and representing developers on plats and, and those are paid. But this one, um, again, is relatively unique. As you know, by statute and, and the ordinance, I'm gonna cite some provisions in the ordinance. The city has taken the position, number one, it doesn't have to decide until a building permit issued. I'm, I'm, I believe that is legally incorrect. And I think there's two legal issues that you as the examiner can rule on either tonight or on an advisory basis is as a matter of law, I'm making two arguments on behalf of my client. One, that this project is exempt. It's either not new development activity or not new residential construction, or there's an exemption in both school and park impact fees for alteration of existing buildings. And the citations I have for you on the exemptions, and, the, and these don't take the discretion of the planning department. They're simply exempt. If, if my project isn't new development activity, new residential construction, or is it altering existing structures, it is exempt from school impact fees. And those citations are um, on the school impact fees, Madam Examiner, it's 3.45.050 sub three, that's the, and for park impact fees, it's 3.50 uh, 050 sub two. Um, and again, there's also a definition on the trigger. The trigger for park impact fees is new residential development. The trigger for school impact fees is development activity. And again, I would argue um, when given the opportunity that these are exempt. We, this is a 104 unit project. Nothing's going to change between now and building permit issuance. In fact, this is the only I, I, permit that's being issued that's discretionary. Building permits, as you know, are gonna be SEPA exempt and non-discretionary. Um, and the way impact fees work, both in statute and the city's impact fee ordinance, which I'm going to cite to you some provisions, is they're assessed. They should be assessed now. They're paid when the building permits are issued, but they should be assessed now. And I, so I'm, I'm making an argument. They're exempt as a matter of law. And then we've also applied for a discretionary exemption. And the city's response only responded to my request to the community and economic development director for a discretionary exemption. And the issue I have there is I disagree wholeheartedly. I think this decision not only should, but almost has to be resolved now. And I'm gonna, I'll go through real quickly my arguments. Um, let's just take the larger impact fee, the main one, the school impact fee. I think the language of the city's own ordinance requires impact fees to be assessed now. Um, they always are, they, they're not assessed when building permits are issued, they're assessed at the time of a plat or a permit uh, and they're just paid later. Under 3.45040, it says, each development activity within the service area as a condition of approval. That's what we're here to do tonight. This is a conditional or special use permit for an SRO um, facility. And I think the city is required if it intends to impose impact fees, which are by the way are approaching a half a million dollars, it needs to do it now. There's also in 345 sub four, it says impact fees required by this chapter are, and then I'm skipping some wording, are imposed at the time of development review and development activity and shall constitute adequate mitigation of all development specific adverse impacts. Um, plain reading of this 
statute on which impact fee ordinances are based. And I'm reading from RCW 82.02.060 says that cities or counties imposing impact fees to adjust the standard impact fee at the time the fee is imposed. Again, statute requires cities to, to allow particular exemptions or waivers based on particular facts. And that's, and the city's ordinances that I was reading to you are based on that statutory authorizing authority. Again, I understand fully what Rick's position is and Mr. Adams and the city attorneys. They're paid when building permits are issued, but they're assessed now. The other reasons that it's really important as Madam Examiner noted is under reg reform, you can only have one open record hearing and one closed record appeal on a particular application. These are major conditions. School impact fees are, are designed to statutorily mitigate a project's alleged impacts on schools. Well, if you issued the permit tonight, this is the only open record hearing. This is the time when impact fees should be imposed the city's impact fee ordinance itself allows me to appeal it to the examiner in a, uh, and and that would violate reg reform if it was a separate process. Um, now we, ha well, we have, can, a I, I guess I have a question on that because yeah, um, I mean, so you can have situations where you have, you know, multiple permits for a project and you can have um, in theory, you could have more than one hearing, but the that's avoided by you know the developer going ahead and applying for you know consolidating everything so they apply for um whatever they need to apply for to hear ev everything all together uh, i guess the question i have is if you wanted to consolidate everything including potentially an appeal on an impact fee determination wouldn't the route be to in addition to applying for this special use permit to also apply for the building permit. And so you have that determination. And if you disagree with it, then you can appeal to the hearing examiner. So you hear everything all at once, including the special permit. And typically, of course, you know, the building permit would come after kind of the land use decision that I that, that I make. Um, that's the more straightforward because there are costs associated with that building permit. But I, but I, um, that would be the that is a route to get everything before, you know, to consolidate everything. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, but I mean, that, that would have been one route, but as you could appreciate, architecturally designed building permit plans are an expensive proposition until you know that your land use is authorized. So, uh, you, you know, where this client, like a lot of clients, Madam Examiner, is in the middle of a due diligence period and it's a finite time period. That would have been one route to go, but it, it's not economical or cost effective. The other route, it looks to me like reading the city's own ordinance, in fact, under the traffic impact fee ordinance expressly authorizes the planning department to provide impact fees up front. I still think the city is under a legal duty to assess them and, and rule on an exemption up front. Um, otherwise, it, it puts a you know, it extends the process and and puts the applicant in an extreme disadvantage when it has to make a decision to buy the property before knowing what the conditions of approval of the permit are. Now, now there is one problem, I'll admit it, and I don't know how to solve it, to be honest with you. And I've talked it over with the client before tonight. Before the Rick White can exercise the discretion and rule on my client's exemption request, by the way, there was no forms or process, and I, I just did it by letter at, at invite. He has to consult with a school district, and that has not occurred yet. You can't grant under the city's own ordinance. It looks like they can't. You can't grant an exemption or waiver from school impact fees without consultation with a school district. But I think that has to happen. Now, I mean, uh, our request was almost four weeks ago. And what concerned me about the city's response to my, to Fortify's exemption request, I was thinking they, they, you know, they didn't say, I need another three weeks to consult with a school district. They basically said, I'm never gonna tell you whether the permits, whether the impact fees apply until you apply for a building permit and I don't have to. And I disagree with that. 
legally. I'm, I also have, a, as I told you before, I have an exemption request based on exemptions that don't require Rick White's discretion nor the school district consultation. Um, I'm just asking the statute to be interpreted, but I would, I, I, I would love an opportunity if I knew that Mr. White was going to issue a decision in the next few weeks, by the way, you, you just indicated let's kill two birds with one stone. And I agree with you. We probably should hold the record open for 14 days on the SEPA DNS to avoid a procedural error. And by the way, that was just, I didn't realize it was reissued. The, our client su su supplied a supplemental checklist in response to a city request. And so they issued a new DNS. The initial one was in draft form. So I would love it if Rick would consult with the school district or maybe set up an appointment to consult with the school district in the next two weeks so we can know. By the way, a, a no is better than a no decision. And, and I, I'll, of note, I found it a little interesting that the city attorney, while citing SEPA case law that has no application to impact fees uh, and, and right for review, said we haven't proven a case for an exemption and, you know, to yeah, no, SEPA does not apply to the- It doesn't apply at all. I, yeah. I, but, but, you know, uh, what, what, he, what, what my client would like is an opportunity to know what it's, the mitigation requirements are gonna be of its projects. It needs to know, are park impact fees gonna be imposed? Are they gonna be mitigated? Are school act impact fees? And this project is not like a apartment complex or a new residence. These are 200 to 250 square foot single room occupancy rooms that don't house children. And in fact, we provided the only study that was available to us. Our client has a lot of these projects in construction right now, but there's one from Vancouver where only one of 50 tenants had a child living in it. As you know, under fair housing laws, we can't prohibit our single room occupancy from being having children, but they're clearly not going to have anywhere near the school impacts that provided the basis for the city's impact fee. In fact, I, I didn't have time to get the study, but I think it's based on a capital facilities plan that assumes two or 2.2 school aged children per every dwelling unit or residence. They're asking to collect a per unit fee, 104 units times $4,700 where kids aren't going to live here. Uh, and I have a qu question, you know, Mr. Pickens, I know there's some ordinances um, that will allow uh, for a kind of a preliminary sort of uh, determination. Uh, I don't know if the, the city, I don't know that the city does, code does have that, but where you can get a preliminary sort of determination, it's not appealable and it doesn't bind the city, but it get, does give the applicant a better sense on what is likely. So it, it, that is it's another way to address that concern you raise about, you know, going, going ahead and going through the building permit process. Um, it has that in 3.40 in the traffic impact fee and 3.40070, the city has that express process. It's school impact fee ordinance isn't written the same way. Okay. I would have, that would have been great. Uh, and we thought, that's what I'm we were doing with the letter. I'm wondering if the city, w I mean, if there is, I don't know the rationale for having it in, in two places, but not the school. I mean, I'm wondering if you all might utilize that route. Like, and I, I'm just, you know, I'm not saying what's the best approach on this because it's a little unusual, but um, we're keeping the record open anyway for two weeks. I mean, another way would be to continue to hearing to the next regularly scheduled um, hearing day, which would be May 12th. Um, and then oh, allow, well. and I'll, I'll need to get city input on that. But, um, and again, I have, the, there's this question for in my mind on jurisdiction and how to deal with this. And I haven't sorted how to, how to land on that, but I'm wondering if a bit more time to work out where the, uh, for the, for the de applicant and the department to work on this a bit might be beneficial to me. Um, and then, um, and I'll take a closer look at the impact fee ordinance, um, particularly with respect to the jurisdictional issue. Um, um, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Cause I, I know it, uh, you, occasionally I will continue a hearing to the next regular, regularly scheduled date. And we have to, we've got it, we're halfway there anyway with the SEPA determination. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I, again, I, I'd appreciate an opportunity for you to maybe ask my client, Mr. Z at El Sahili, but we're under mm -hmm. some time pressures. My my preference would be to finish the hearing tonight, to take all the testimony of record, to make the presentation and leave the record open. I would love an opportunity to sit down and speak with Rick uh, or Eric Ferguson and Jeff, or, or better yet, have a meeting with the school district. Full disclosure, I did see Mr. Dave Zabel, the city manager, at another hearing yesterday, and he thought that was a good idea. If I could, but if the issue, if the city says, sorry, Mark, I'm not going to schedule it, I'm not making a decision to a building permit, I disagree. And now, obviously, my, my legal remedy would be I could sue the city for mandamus and see if I could prove my case and order Rick to do this. But I don't want to do that. It, 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 it's not worth it. I think... I think a decision should be made or a reasonable timeline set by the city to rule on a proper exemption request where I think we've met our burden of going forward. Uh, it, it it puts our client in an extreme disadvantage and you know nobody wants to file appeals on an unopposed you know permit that allows a hotel to be substantially upgraded. So that's that, that that's my con concern so my initial i would say finish the hearing tonight keep the record open for 14 days and then maybe we could uh, get together with a joint statement on agreement to disagree i think you as the examiner should uh, one of the conditions should be whether or not impact fees are triggered by this project um you can't rule on the discretionary exemption request that has to require a decision from rick white i get that but I do think it's a purely legal issue whether well, or not. You may have a point there because certainly, for example, in the Platt context, um, when I look through as to whether school impacts are addressed, I mean, school impact fees are a key factor in that decision. Now, there may be exactly, you know, sometimes exactly how all that unfolds after my decision, you know, I'm not, I'm not privy to. Um, well, and there always let's let's use a plat, Madam Examiner. There always a condition of approval of a significant plat because that becomes of record binding. You don't want to have BFPs. You don't want to have right. a person buying a lot and going in for a building permit to build a house and going, oh, you owe me four thousand seven hundred dollars. I mean, the 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 impact fees are normally assessed at the time of the permit approval and paid at the time of building permit, and all this client wants as an opportunity to to have a decision made on this exemption request. Uh, and, and by the way, I, it'd almost be better to have a no, and then I'll appeal it to you within 10 days. We'll be right back to where we are right now. You'll have, I'll have my same, uh, same arguments and you'll be making the decision. So the, I just want to get it to a point where both parties are comfortable that the process is proper uh and so the, the, those are my thoughts complete the hearing 14 days open we'll get back to you on that but i do think there are some legal issues that you have jurisdiction to rule on and in fact if i'm taking a straight line if you don't impose impact fees and approve the permit i might argue that the city's precluded from imposing those at a later time but i i, I my main disagreement right now with the city is that they don't have to make a decision at all on a legitimate exemption request. They they have all the information they're ever going to have. There's no studies. There's no permits. The project's not going to change. The 104 units are the same. Um, you know, and, and uh, I, I just found they're 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 wanting to postpone the decision. Strange. Mark, I want to jump in real quick. Can you guys hear me? If you could state your name for the record. Robert Johnson. Um, and you swear or affirm to tell the truth on our penalty of perjury at the laws of the state of Washington? Yes, Madam Examiner. Yeah, Thank you. I just want to put in context the fees. Um, from what I understand, they're 45, 45, 25 per unit. And, you know, just doing a little math, um, we're buying this 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 very poorly performing property for about $3,700, excuse me, $37,000 per, per unit. That 4,500 fee is, you know, for a multifamily project, Averages about two hundred thousand per unit, right? So if you take that fee, that's that's about two point two percent of a of a typical multifamily na national average um, 
um, you know, ratio is about 2.2%. You apply that to our purchase price at 37,000, it's like 12 and a half percent. It's just so we on the, and then the, your, your own um, development standard number six um, states that we, that there to be no more than two adults over the age of 18. So, I mean, your own development standards require adults. Um, it's common knowledge that there'll be, if we, if there's just going to be so few children, if any, and we're being charged five, six times more than a typical multifamily development. Surely we are hoping that somebody can come to the table. I mean, the last thing we want is somebody to just say, no, you have to pay the $4,500. We think that is, um, you know, this project is really addressing uh, a, an acute need. And we're also helping to rehab, you know, crime laden and some very underperforming motels. So I just wanted to launch, put that in, in the record that, you know, in the spirit of trying to make things work, when you look at this on a relative basis, we're being huge. I mean, it's just a sixth multiple um, of what, what a typical multifamily development would be paying. So, and we're not disturbing, we're not adding any new units, we're just renovating the interior. So I'll pass that my time back over to Mark. Okay, and Mr. Johnson, um, do you have anything on the landscaping or should I be asking yeah. Elsa Hill about that? No, um, no. well, let me, let me um, I spoke to the owner, uh, the seller, excuse me, we have a good good rapport. And, and Mark did tell you about the fact that you know, we haven't closed a transaction, we're close and, and we're nervous about closing it. And then all of a sudden we're getting hit with, you know, potentially if you throw the park fee and, and the full school fee, that's $670,000, it's a big deal. So, um, I mean, you know, we're purchasing the property for, you know, a, you know, it's a song. Um, so it becomes a, a very big a percentage of the, of the overall purchase price. So the, um, the owner, the seller had just literally within 30 days planted fi around 500 two and a half to three foot tall plants, three feet on centers around the entire perimeter of the site. And I, I said, his name is Capri. I said, Capri, do you have, can you please give us the city sighting of the, you know, who at the city? He can't remember. Um, but, he, you know, he just, I remember him telling me that he was doing all this landscape work. And I'm like, oh, well, yeah, I, I suppose you should do it if the city wants you to. I I, I will grant can, you that. Can you, can you provide something in writing, just documenting what's uh, been put in? Um, because that, that does address, um, you know, impacts um, in terms right. of you know, aesthetics. Um, and right. certainly and it would be typical with something when you're, uh, I mean, this is housing now. So it, that would be pretty standard to have, um, you know, some form of landscaping there. So, right. um, and it, I think that does relate to the, the, the this dispute over kind of whether or not there should be a wall there as well. Right. And, and just for the record that these plants, um, they're not shrubs and remain shrubs. These plants are expected to grow um, about two and a half feet per year. So in a couple of years, they'll be over nine, 10 feet. So just okay. just know that as well. Yeah, that's I, definitely I will forward the email from the seller. Um, that, that would that would be helpful because um, certainly that's relevant to my decision. Thank you. I'll, I'll circulate that through Mark Fix. Okay. And that, just be sure to provide that to the, the Mr. Fickus. You should just be sure to provide that to the planning department. Yeah, that that would be fine. That's a, I just learned about that yesterday. That I, I'd be real intrigued maybe jeff adams could make a comment on what was the trigger what trigger did they have to require an existing owner to landscape uh, uh an existing property being used as a hotel but that's that's a interesting by the by but if there's some existing site screening we would certainly submit that instead of the architectural block wall fence and and doing both uh would not be justified so i i guess i'll i'll, I'll uh i don't have a lot more to present other than I, I do think it would help uh, both the city and the applicant if the examiner could could review the ordinance and 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 provide some preliminary determinations on whether this is exempt and does the city have to respond I, I hope the city's position is not final I'd love an opportunity to negotiate with uh, anyone there and, and it's just time is of the essence and yeah, um, I, I actually was thinking about making some sort of preliminary, not not a decision, but an indication to the parties of where I'm leaning on with respect to this issue. And then that will help inform you all in terms of uh, what additional would be needed within, you know, the, the time that the record is being kept open. 
Um, and I would anticipate providing that to the city um, by Monday. Um, if I can do it before, then great, but I don't, I'll, I can promise by Monday. That would be wonderful. Um, Matt, Madam Examiner, uh, for the record, this is attorney Jeff Briggs for the city. Um, may I just respond briefly to the yeah, let me, absolutely. And I, I'll give you an opportunity. Let me finish with the applicant just to keep yeah, this sure. orderly, but um, yes. absolutely. Yeah. All right, Madam, Madam Examiner, I'll, 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 I'll uh, punt now to uh, Mr. Johnson and Mr. El Sahili if they have anything to say, but my, on, on the legal issues, uh, I simply ask that the block wall condition be removed and that, and that the impact fee exemption be granted, uh, knowing where, where, that there's procedural issues. So, so I would like uh, my client to address some of the requirements of the SRO permit. I don't think it's, uh, I, I think we accept all the other four recommended conditions of approval and the staff did a really good okay. thorough job on its amended staff report. So I don't think there's any controversial issues, but with that, I'll uh, I'll uh, turn it over to Mr. Johnson and Mr. El Sahili. Okay. I'm just gonna take, it's Robert Johnson again. I'm gonna take a second and I wanted to go through the, um, development standards and really quickly because I don't want to take more than two minutes here but um, I'm assuming Madam Examiner you, you see how we basically met the conditions there's a couple of things I want to um, call to the attention um, the first is um, you know in terms of the, you know, the first several conditions um, you know we meet the HUD requirements for the size and um, the off-street parking will be met um, handicapped units at the time when we did this we thought there was five there's actually less. The owner was a little aggressive in his assessment. Just be assured that we will we will um, provide full handicapped units in accordance with however the city rules um, to meet that uh, one in, in twenty requirement. Um, in in terms of um, this is really important uh, standard number six. This is not only just your your average SRO, which technically can have um, one kitchenette. Um, for every three units per floor, excuse me, one bathroom for every three units per floor and one, uh, hold on, I got that a little bit backwards. Um, um, yeah, bathrooms and kitchenettes, one full bathroom for every three units per floor and one kitchenette per floor. We're, we're, we're gonna cite a full bathroom and a full kitchenette for each unit. Um, it's certainly added expense, but that's just our development um, standard within. Um, we're a little concerned about the 24 hour monitoring and uh, we hope that maybe there'll be some consideration that we are going to be, you know, over improving this relative to the to the to the ordinance. Um, and we, we're just we're questioning whether we really need a full 24 hour manned um, on site, you know, monitoring. So that's pretty much it. Unless you have any questions for me, I'd like to turn it over real briefly to the president um, of Board of Vice Yad El Sahili. Uh, Mr. El Sahili, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can. If you could state your name again for the record. My name is Ziad El Sahili, uh, president of Fortify Holdings. And you swear or affirm to tell the truth under penalty of perjury under the laws of the state of Washington? I do. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, Madam Examiner. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to kind of jump on and uh, talk about who we are a little bit. I don't want to take too long either, but uh, just give a little background on Fortify and what we do and why we're here. Um, so as Mr. Fickus alluded to, we're a Portland, Oregon based uh, real estate investor and developer. We own more than 3000 residences across 26 properties throughout Oregon, Washington and Idaho. Um, our goal is to create and maintain quality uh, residences that uh, people are proud to call home. Um, historically, we've done so by taking under managed or uh, distressed uh, multifamily projects and rehabbing them and making them into clean, safe, uh, and accessible homes. Um, in all our investments, we typically uh, find communities similar to Pasco where there's a shortage of housing and a need of housing, a need of clean, safe housing, and we bring it to the market. Um, as of late and over the past year and a half, we've been identifying a unique opportunity in a lot of these markets in the Pacific Northwest to um, take existing hotels and motels 
uh, where the housing stocks needed and converting them into high quality, newly remodeled apartment units, similar to what we're looking at here in Pasco uh, for the SRO project, um, targeting, you know, workforce housing uh, in these communities. Um, you know, we're not a flipper, we buy and hold. And we have all these properties and we usually, uh, we've never sold one in my time here and um, we don't intend on uh, flipping this. We'd like to maintain a relationship with the communities we're in. Um, and in fact, we're looking at um, even expanding our footprint in Pasco and we've identified another property over there that we can, that we'll be doing something very similar on uh, down the road. Um, but I mostly just wanted to introduce myself to this forum and uh, state kind of who we are and what, what our intentions are. And uh, we're looking forward to kind of investing in Pasco and expanding a little bit there. Thank you. Um, so at this point, and we'll, I'll come back to the city, but I just want to verify, um, check on whether there's anyone from the public um, who wish to comment on the proposal. I do not see any anyone who has signed in. Uh, but Mr. White, if um, I'm incorrect on that, let me know. Nope, you're correct, ma'am. Okay, let the record reflect there was no one who wished to provide comment uh, this evening on this proposal. Um, so back to the city, um, should we then turn to uh, Mr. Briggs? Did you, you had indicated um, you had wanted to comment on this or uh, Mr. Adams may uh, is likely wishes to right. speak as well? Uh, no, no, Your Honor, this is uh, Mr. Briggs. Just, just briefly responding to um, Mr. Fickus's uh, legal arguments. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I would point your attention to the uh, definition in the school impact fee ordinance to um, development activity, which uh, at, at the outset indicates that that includes uh, residential construction. And so this is again, converting hotel units into um, houses essentially. And so one, one would assume persons living in houses would not re require um, you know, schools for their children, whereas someone who's going to be permanently residing there would. So we do think that this would not be categorically exempt under the uh, impact fee ordinance and would, you know, trigger that ordinance. And uh, it's it's uh, something that isn't right. But I think we all agree that the consultation has to occur and there has to be a final decision rendered by the city in order for um, that decision to become appealable. Under um, municipal code 345-0604, it does authorize the hearing examiner to review a final decision on an adjustment re request. And then it, it sort of cycles back to the transportation impact fee ordinance. Now that ordinance uh, indicates that the examiner can only um, determine whether or not the assessment of the fee is reasonable. So there can't be adjustments made, just whether it's it's, it's reasonable or unreasonable. And again, the issue isn't ripe for that reason. It's not ripe because of, of the scoping issue as well. This hasn't been, uh, this is an issue that's gonna be you know, determined at the building permit stage of, of development, again, because that's a development activity. Um, and, and so once, once we get to that issue though, then the question becomes, has the applicant supported their request for, um, you know, some form of a deviation in, in this circumstance it would be a determination that the fee is unreasonable. Have they supported that by substantial evidence? And all we really have here is, you know, and a story and uh, some anecdotal evidence. And I, I've, I have no reason to believe that that's not the case, but I don't know that that's, you know, a sufficient basis to conclude that in, in this circumstance, there's not going to be, you know, school age children living there. And in order for us to adjust the fee, we really need to know, um, you know, the, the extent to which, um, you know, an adjustment is warranted. We can't just pull a number out of thin air. So that's, that, that's sort of the uh, challenge here. And that's why, again, when you're talking about school impact fees, you're not talking about uh, the city's burden to prove some sort of individualized determination under Nolan and Dolan, which was cited by the developer uh, the, the, the Drebeck, uh, case, you know, the recent Supreme court case, I guess it's 2006. So not terribly recent indicated that really the burden is on 
the developer to show that the school or that the impact fee should not be assessed as long as the um, city can show that the impact fee is reasonably related to impacts to the system. I think the city has has shown that through you know through the development itself and the fact that you know there's no restriction on school age children. Uh, it's you know this impact fee is reasonably related to the impacts of that development. And so I, I know we're not there yet. We're not to the issue of, of whether or not, you know, the school impact fee is reasonable. But I think once we get there, uh, the applicant has not met its, its burden of supporting uh, some sort of deviation from that fee. And that's, and, and that's all I have, Madam Examiner. Thank you, Mr. Briggs. Um, mm -hmm. Mr. Adams, so I think back to you. Um, do you have input on the um, various issues that have been discussed tonight? And I do have a question for you on the landscaping. Um, I don't know if you have any, if are aware of, kind of the new the landscaping that's being that's uh, sounds like in the process of being installed. Has been. Oh, it has been. So it's done. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, Mr. Adams, do you have any documentation on that or anything from the city that could just, um, and I know the applicant will provide some detail on that, but. Uh... Well, if it were, if it was done through our department, it wasn't from, from my desk. <laughs> I, it might've been okay. through code enforcement. Um, okay. Given the fact that the, the most recent photographs that I took, um, there was virtually no landscaping, even though landscaping would have been required for, um, not only initial installation at time of build, but also maintenance. And so it seems like the landscaping that might have been there at one time was lost or removed. And so they might have Not, just been okay. restoring. But I don't I don't know for sure. OK, well, if, if, if you do have anything on that, that would be helpful. And of course, the the applicant has indicated that they would provide documentation on that as well. Um, I had uh, indicated earlier that I'll, I'm going to take a closer look at the impact fee ordinance, and there are <laughs> some questions in my mind on exactly how to address this, um, but I'll have kind of some preliminary direction for the parties by Monday, and I'm thinking at this point we'll keep the record open for two weeks, so that would be through April, April uh, 28th, um, 5 p.m., I mean, in theory, if we had a SEPA appeal, we we would have to can reopen the record and hold the yeah. hearing and all you know that. I think that's highly unlikely, <laughs> given um, that there wasn't um, any comment this evening from the public. So I'm not anticipating any need to do that. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to add or had any further comment on? Madam Examiner, this is uh, Rick White, and there is one thing I just want to make sure that the record is clear on. Um, no, do Ms. I swear you in? I, can't, I don't think I... Oh, do I need to swear you nope. in? Yes, I think you do. Okay. All right. If you could state your name again for the record. Rick White. <clears throat> and you swear or affirm to tell the truth under penalty of perjury under the laws of the state of Washington? I do. Thank you. Um, as, as Mr. Fickus noted, uh, he, he's entirely correct. I must confer with the Pasco School District on an adjustment to the impact fee, and that has not happened yet, but it, uh, it has not been for lack of trying. I'm working with two representatives of the district. They both had differing times away from uh, their jobs in the past two weeks, and we simply have not come up with a time that's been uh, jointly acceptable to myself and those two representatives. Um, so that is, I'm trying to get that tied up and uh, hopefully within, hopefully this week, we'll be able to um, accomplish that. Okay, that's, thank you for that um, update. Um, and, and examiner, this is Mark Fickus again. And, mm -hmm. and this is really a question to Rick. Uh, Rick, would it be possible for a Fortify representative to participate in that consultation? Um, not not legal counsel. I don't want to scare people away, but um, could Mr. Johnson participate uh, in, in in your consultation? Because there might be options to resolve this uh, if they were there. There's exactly. it's not an all or nothing item. It's not no impact fees or all impact fees. 
there might be some compromise possible if a Fortify representative was present. Would that be possible, Rick? Um, cer certainly, I'll, I don't want to overstep uh, any protocol here, particular since we don't have any established protocol. We have not encountered this situation yet. Um, I would um, probably want to confer with uh, Mr. Briggs, uh, but what I would suggest, at least at this point, uh, Mr. Fickus, in regard to your question, is that um, I at least be able to meet with the district and um, would certainly uh, be willing to suggest that a second appointment or arrangement or Zoom meeting, whatever we can do, uh, occur between Mr. Johnson, let's say, and myself and the district. That, that would be great, Rick. Yeah, and just as a note on that, so if the parties are able to resolve this, I mean, that's always the best. That's always my preferred. I think those types of solutions um, always work better than when kind of an outsider uh, like myself, you know, um, decides these things. So um, if the parties are able to coordinate the, uh, and resolve anything on that, um, go ahead and put that into the record if, if that should occur. Um, and there'll be there's a sound there there'll be time to to do that so um let's see All right, i don't think i have any other questions for the parties is there anything else that um anyone wanted to bring to, um, to my attention this evening um madam examiner um this the condition of the wall was also mentioned and the oh, one right. Yes. Actually, I meant to ask, thank you for bringing that up. I meant to ask about that. Um, in any follow up comments from the department on that? Um, we'd like to state simply that that is the standard for subdivisions adjacent major arterial streets. And since Oregon Avenue is not only a major arterial, but it's also a major truck route, um, that would be a logical um, a standard improvement for that um, property. Madam Examiner, this is Mark Fickus. This isn't a subdivision, and it's inconsistent with 25.180. Uh, and by the way, you can't require walls on an existing building. They're non-conforming uses. So I, 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 don't, I still don't see a legal basis to impose an architectural block wall. I understood. I understand both arguments. Um, and again, if, um, if we can get documentation on the landscaping, that would definitely help. Um, I, I would just add... Um, this is Mr. Briggs again. Um, Mark, I, I don't see any problem um, with having the applicant uh, attend that meeting. I'll confirm with my supervisor, Eric. Um, the one thing that I would want to know for sure, though, is the number of, of units. So in the SEPA checklist, it says... It, it's um, 104. It's not going to yeah, change. Like, okay. that, yeah, that's, gonna, that's never going to change. Address that, Rick. I mean, they're, okay. they're existing 104 motel units. If anything, we're going to have less. Okay, I mean, we're not going to expand the building envelope to add units that would be massively cost prohibitive. So it will I saw your your, your response to Mark's letter, but we will right. never be increasing the 104. It's just not physically possible under the scope of our investment. Okay, great. And so just, I'll, just I'll run that the, by Eric. Just for the record with Mr. Johnson, was that you that was just confirmed yes, the number there? Oh, yeah, that was Thank me. you. Okay. All right. Anything else this evening? Okay. All right. Um, so just to conclude records open for two weeks, I'll get a preliminary um, determination out uh, by Monday. But if there are any updates from the parties on progress um, on the disputed issues, um, please go ahead and provide that to me as soon um, as there is agreement uh, on anything. Um, and I think with that, um, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.